Samuel, that God is king. And so today as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and we continue through this new series, I want to encourage you, there are notes on the back of your bulletin and the scripture references that I give as part of the main points are also listed there for you. Uh, if you're using one of the chair pocket Bibles there in front of you, 1 Samuel 2 is found on page 267. But I want us to understand before we read that 1 Samuel 2 is a chapter of contrast. That's why it says God in contrast. And the way we must understand God in contrast is to understand that God is God. And I say, Pastor John, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, let me help you a little bit. The problem we have as human beings is our perspective is us. And we weigh the world, and we weigh our response to the world, and we weigh our lives based upon us. Let me tell you, the universe doesn't revolve around us. And if you're thinking, I'm glad he didn't say that to me, if you can hear my voice, you're one of us. Okay? God... The reason we have to look at God in both comparison and contrast is because God is God. The song that we just sang reminds us of God sending his son to us. Why did God have to send his son to us? Because we were helpless. The Bible makes it clear in our sin state, we're helpless. God had to come to us. There's nothing any of us individually or even all of us together could do to reach out and grasp God. He has made himself known to us. And so our frame of reference need to, needs to change from us, from me, to God. And then when you have God as a frame of reference, then you can start making contrasting and comparisons that would help you better understand the world in which we live. Let me give it to you in general. The world in which we live is sin-filled. Thus it operates in contrast to God who is holy. God who is righteous. Let me see if I can help you understand it a little bit better. God is creator. What does that statement mean? That means God is above, beyond, and outside of his creation. How does that help us? We're limited to time and space inside of creation. See how that puts us in comparison to God who is outside of all of that? And not only God in his greatness as creator, he didn't have to work for it. He just spoke it into existence. Have you stared at the red hills lately? Have you looked up into the night sky lately? Have you paid any attention to anything in creation? If you have, then realize God just spoke that into existence. In contrast, how many times when you say something, does it immediately happen? Yeah, none. <laughs> none of the time. See the contrast between us, us and God. And so that'll help us in this chapter. This chapter is a chapter of comparison and contrast with God. And so God, in his greatness, graciously knew he had to come to us. But in a text like this, he helps us see who we are in comparison to him. Now, before that makes you feel really, 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 really small, okay? That God who is that great is the God who loves you so much he would send his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. I mean, is God incredible or what? So, Let's look at this text together and see the contrast and the comparison. And we'll see it in the examples of the human beings that are mentioned here. Remember, Samuel is a historical narrative. And so from it, we want to learn about God as we will today. But we also maybe will gain some insight into us and into humanity in general. And we will start with Hannah's prayer of praise. 
We didn't look at it last week, but last week we introduced Hannah as one who was barren, but God gave her Samuel. And young Samuel, she then in turn gave back to God. And as a result, Hannah wrote this psalm or this poem, which was both a prayer and a praise. And in it, we're going to see both the contrast and the comparisons between God and the ungodly. And so notice this as we read. I'm going to read 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may have seen the back and forth even in these 10 verses that we read. You may have picked up on the movements of the psalm or the poem as she was praying and giving praise to God. And they will give us this outline that we will see. But it begins with Hannah's recognition of who God is. That's why I said earlier, when your point of reference starts with self, you're already headed down the wrong road. Our point of reference for everything in creation has to begin with God because God's the creator. So Hannah, in her words of praise, recognizes who God is and she esteems God for just the very character of his being. Look at verses 1 and 2. And then we'll touch again on verses 9 and 10. We see a clear description of God's character and his attributes, which are the result of this proclamation of both her faith, her praise, and her trust in God. Look at verses 1 and 2. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice where? I rejoice in your salvation. My rejoicing is in what the Lord offers in salvation. Then she goes on, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. In other words, God is the Lord and there ain't even a close second. I hope we understand that. And then in verses 9 and 10, well, let me finish uh, verse 2. There's none holy like the Lord, for there's none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Verse 9. He, talking about God, will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Can you see how God's working here in the recognition of beginning with who God is? And then she closes her psalm 
with recognizing that ultimately, because God is who he is and he deserves the praise just as a recognition of his very being, he also is the judge. And he will. And, and just think, this was probably written a thousand years before Christ came. So we're talking 3,000 plus years ago when this was written. Can you see the only hope of mankind is that a holy and just judge is going to take care of everything in the end? I mean, 3,000 years ago, they were sensing the same concept. God's stuff is messed up in this world. I'm glad you, one day, are finally going to make it all straight. You're going to straighten it out, and you're going to make it right. Because he is the judge. There's no one holy like the Lord. There's no rock like our God. And he guards his faithful ones, is what she proclaims. There's our strength until God finally does make it all right. He is my rock. He guards his faithful ones. He is the Lord who is above all else. We sang it earlier in a song. Even when I can't feel it, I know it. Even when I can't sense it, I know it. I trust it and I believe it because that's how God's made himself known. Is everything going the way I want it? Absolutely not. Is everything perfect in my life? Absolutely not. Maybe you don't ever have to do this. I'm one of those list makers, daytimers, calendar people for each day. I can't remember the last time at the end of the day I looked back and went, wow, everything went just like I planned. I'm not in control, but I know who is, and there's none holy like him, and he is my rock, and I know he guards me in spite of whether things go my way or not. See why our focus needs to be God-centered and not self-centered? And he will, at the end, make it all work out. He's the one true God. We rejoice in him. We trust in him because he is both our savior and the judge. You know, when the end does come, you're going to want to be on the judge's side. You know how you get on the judge's side? Faith in Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you. Now let's look, I encourage you with that perspective of God as we now begin to look at some of the contrast. We didn't read it, but if you look at chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, God's word gives us some interesting commentary on some of the people in this historic narrative. In case you don't understand Hebrew, the English translation is really straightforward here. Look at verse 12 of chapter 2. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. Anybody not understand? Anybody not understand? Your translation may say corrupt. That's a good word for it as well. They were worthless. They were corrupt. But here's the problem. Look at the next phrase in verse 12. They did not know the Lord. They did not know the Lord. And verses 13 through 17 go on to describe their ungodliness and the way they dealt with people as they were supposed to be the priests of the people and helping them worship and sacrifice. And we won't take the time to go through it, but it describes just the most ungodly way that they acted. Why? Because they were worthless. Why? Because they didn't know the Lord. And we see that in the psalm that Hannah prayed and praised. Look at verse 6 of chapter 2. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings to Sheol, he brings down to Sheol, and he raises up. God's the one who's in charge. God's the one who's going to lift those who are faithful to him and judge those who are not. Um, those who are in the Sunday school class that I taught this morning, James 4, 6 says what? God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Yeah. 
God's not neutral with anyone. Don't leave here thinking, boy, God's not concerned about that person at all. There's no neutrality with God. You're either on his side or you're against him. And he will deal with you accordingly. He's going to raise up the faithful. He's going to judge those who turn against him. If that doesn't scare you, it should. <laughs> you know, I heard growing up, you know, those preachers who preach damnation and hellfire and brimstone, they're just scaring people to Jesus. I don't care how you get to Jesus. You need to get to Jesus. Amen. Now, you might have some ethnical issues with that. But this scripture right here says God's the one who raises up and God's the one who sends to Sheol. You notice it doesn't say there are some who are going to stay right in the middle. That's why I say there's no neutrality with God. But then look at what she goes on to say. He, verse 8 of chapter 2. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. You see how she's in her psalm distinguishing those who are godly and those who are not? And who do we know is not godly in this text? Eli's sons. Let me repeat it again in case you didn't catch it the first time. They were worthless. Okay. I can't think of any way that word in English would be a compliment. They were corrupt. You know, he's corrupt and a good guy. Those phrases rarely go together. Okay? Some people might call some of our politicians that, but they're only right the first half. Okay? A little personal commentary. So again, the chapter reveals contrast. We see the contrast of Eli's sons being worthless contrasted with Samuel, who, if you look at verse 21, tells us this. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she con or this is chapter 1, verse 21. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Remember, she was the one who was barren. She was the one who was teased and ridiculed. She was the one who just kept faithfully serving and worshiping the Lord in chapter 1. And God blessed her and gave her children. Look at verse 26. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. That's an interesting statement there. If you fast forward to Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel says that about Jesus, that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Pretty high compliment right there, isn't it? That his upbringing was compared to that of Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you as chapter 2 compares Samuel. Did I say chapter 1 when I mentioned verse 21 and 26? Mistaken. Chap we're still in chapter 2. Sorry. I think I tried to have you turn back. Chapter 2, verse 21 and 26. Rewind that and then go back over everything I just said. Okay? I'll be glad to repeat it, though, if you want me to. No. Okay. I got you. So Samuel is set apart from his very origins and then in his upbringing. And none of this is accidental. Look at chapter 2, verse 31 and 34. This is towards the end of the chapter. As the scripture records for us, Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. This is a condemnation against Eli because of his sons. And what did we learn from verse 12 of chapter 2 about Eli's sons? Worthless. Yes. They were worthless. And so as a result, God is judging Eli's household. Look at verse 34 of chapter 2. And in this judgment, in verse 34, it says, And that this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, 
shall be a sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. When the prophet of God is speaking that, I'd say you better sit up and pay attention. And that's how God, in contrast to Hannah and Samuel and those that were faithful, contrasted to Eli's sons who were worthless and didn't know the Lord. God now, in contrast, will raise up and send down. Because God contrasts both his judgment and his favor. And as we've talked about this finality of God's judgment, we want to be so careful about the actions of God that are recorded for us here. And they reveal a clear difference both in heart and in service and in faithfulness to the Lord. I said it before, there's no neutrality with God. Let me also just add on top of that, there's no faking it with God. There is no faking it with God. You're not pulling one over on God. You may be thinking like Hophni and Phinehas. Well, we're going through the duties of a priest and we're ripping off the people while we're doing it. That didn't go unnoticed. In fact, God recorded it for all of eternity and called them worthless. And now Eli is receiving a judgment upon his lineage, upon his household because of such. God takes down and God raises up. And who was God raising up? God was raising up Samuel. Samuel, who was born to a woman and a, who was faithful. And then he received that blessing as well. So with the Lord, there is judgment. But let me remind you, with judgment, there is also hope. Look at verse 30 of chapter 2. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. He's continuing because Samuel was of the priestly lineage. And he's saying, none of your house is going to be a part of this anymore, but there will be one, or there will be those, if you look at the end of the verse there, there will be those who will honor me, and I will honor them. How do we honor God? By our faith and our trust, by our surrender and our worship. So yes, God is a God of judgment, but he also, even at the end of this judgment upon Eli's house, reveals the hope for any and everyone else. Honor me, and I will honor you. Go back and read the first couple of commandments in Exodus chapter 19 and 20 of the Ten Commandments. There's only one God. There's to be no other. You've heard all of that. So there's even hope in the midst of this judgment because God is still weaving his redemption through this historical narrative in this Old Testament text, laying the foundation for Christ who is to come. How do I know that? Look at verse 35 of chapter 2. And what does God say? I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. Does the name Jesus the Christ come pop right out of that verse? Look at what he says. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. In the context, they probably wouldn't have realized that God was giving an inkling of the Savior who was to come. But we have the benefit of looking backwards. And what's hindsight? Hindsight's always 2020. Okay? And we see that in the midst of these corrupt 
worthless priest that God was judging and taking out of the picture, and in the elevation of this young man, Samuel, who would faithfully serve the Lord, God is saying, I'm going to have someone. But we know, even all the way back from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that God started weaving that thread of the one who would crush the head of the serpent. And that's Jesus Christ. And this is just a piece of that thread that we're seeing through the tapestry of history that's recorded for us right here. God will accomplish his plan. Praise be to God. Our surrender and our faithful service to the Lord is what connects us to this blessing of God saying 3,000 years ago, those who honor me, I will honor. Notice God didn't say those who honor me, I'll give them whatever they want. Can I just let you in on why our world now and 3,000 years ago was such a mess? Because human beings were getting what they wanted. God says those who honor me, I will honor. That's when we look at that creator God, the almighty, the holy, righteous, and true, who's so far above and beyond that as the apostle Paul wrote to the early church, mind cannot fathom, neither can ear. We can't even think about what God has. We can't even comprehend about what God has for those who love him. And so we see that weaving through this text. And in our connection to this, we, in obedience to God's word, honor God. And as a result, we know he will honor those who honor him. If this sense of judgment leaves you absent of the joy of the Lord, let me bring you back to the beginning of chapter 2, part of Hannah's psalm of praise. I rejoice in your salvation. That's what she says. I rejoice in your salvation because there is none holy like the Lord because there is none besides him. And there is no rock like our God. Is that your prayer? Is that your praise? Is that your heart's desire to honor the Lord in that way? Would you join me in a word of prayer?